Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Wednesday, May 29th, 2024 at 5.15 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of setting a public hearing for the 2024 <laughs> pavement marking project and holding a public hearing for the price grant application. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for May 29th, 2024. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during tonight's public hearing. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there's any public input for the public hearing. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate that you would like to speak um, to the public hearing in the chat function or note that you would like to speak to the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate the public hearing you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted <coughs> by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's Office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Cavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Thank you. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Thank you. Our first item tonight under item set for public hearing, we have the 2024 pavement marking project initiate public bidding process and setting date for public hearing for June 3rd, 2024. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move to receive and file. Adopt the resolution and set the public hearing for June 3rd. Second, second. by Farber. Got a motion by Rosano, second by Farber. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Next, we have our public hearing, which is hold public hearing for the price grant application. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second by Sprank. A motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Mike, please. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council hold a public hearing on May 29th following a 15-day public comment period to solicit input on the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, price grant application, which is due July 10th, 2024. The price grant application for the City of Dubuque will request funding to purchase Table Mound mobile home parks, of which there is two, as well as request to purchase Terrace Heights mobile home park. The land will be purchased through a community land trust that the City will help create with a nonprofit partner organization and remain in the community land trust. Funds are also being requested to improve water, sewer, and road infrastructure within the mobile home park to alleviate the cost burden of major infrastructure to help keep lot rents affordable. Additionally, funds will be requested to rehabilitate or replace mobile homes and weatherize them within those three parks. Services such as eviction prevention and income loss prevention will be provided through the grant and operated by the Community Land Trust. Lot rent has more than doubled in the past five years for some of these mobile home <coughs> homeowners and is quickly becoming a less affordable housing option in Dubuque. Upgrading infrastructure and maintaining the new infrastructure on, under a nonprofit model like a community land trust will maintain and expand this affordable housing option in Dubuque. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request mayor and city council approval and uh, Alexis Steger is here to present some information. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, Alexis Steger, Housing and Community Development Director. I just wanna just quick give a brief summary of what's in the application um, so that there isn't any confusion about what we're applying for. Um, our application is now due July 10th. It was ju due June 5th. Um, HUD has extended that di deadline as this is a massive application. So as you can see from the documents you have, 
it takes a lot of work, so they have extended that. Um, the goal of this grant is those uh, three bullets that you see there, it can assist basically with anything a manufactured home park may need to stay affordable. And the goal is um, you get bonus points in this application to keep it affordable for 30 years or longer. So they're really looking to keep manufactured homes as affordable units for the community. Dubuque's uh, application is going to do a few things. So the first thing, the first goal is to form a community land trust. That community land trust would be uh, run by a nonprofit organization. And then those that are renting the land can be the shareholders in that land trust. And they serve on the board. They help set policy and regulations for that community land trust. So things that work for them. Um, then we're going to, that community land trust is going to work on the acquisition. Acquisition, acquisition activities take quite some time with these uh, mobile home parks. So um, they're going to work to acquire both sides of Table Mountain. There's a, a side in the city and then the highway separates them and there's a side in the county. And then Terrace Heights as well um, if HUD awards all of what we're asking for. And then they're going to upgrade infrastructure as the city manager uh, mentioned. Each park actually needs something a little bit different in their infrastructure. They all need water, sewer, and road, but it all in different ways. So I'm not gonna get super specific about each park, um, but they each have different needs. The one need that they do share is uh, storm shelters. So um, neither park has uh, the minimum code requirement for the state for their storm shelters. So the um, code requirement is for distance from each individual mobile home, as well as the size in which it is so that everybody can fit in it. So we need two storm shelters um, added to make sure we meet at least the minimum code requirements for those shelters. And the goal is to make those uh, gathering spaces for residents as well so that they can be revenue generating. That helps with the nonprofit part and keep lot rents lower. Uh, another piece of the application is the actual manufactured home themselves. Um, it'll be rehabilitation or replacement of those. Um, anything pre-1976 has to be replaced. You cannot rehab under HUD's rules. So if the um, one itself is pre-1976, it would be a replacement. We would just purchase the replacement, remove the old one, and put the new one in. Otherwise, it's rehabilitation. With the rehabilitation, uh, one of the goals is weatherization. So that they will be working on some of the underbellies, uh, some of the work with the water lines that actually help weatherize some of that underneath. Um, so that is one of the goals. Our proposed timeline, it is a six-year uh, grant, and HUD has said that they will let us know in September. They've moved that application back, so it might be September, October before we actually see um, if we get the award. And if we do, here's kind of the um, timeline that we're proposing. Budget-wise, um, this is the, these are tentative until we get all of our public comment and information in. Um, our goal is to make sure it's $50 million or less that we are asking for for this application due to our community size and how much HUD is awarding um, to communities. So we're trying to stay in that sweet spot to get the award, but we're also tiering it because HUD can award a partial grant to you. So we want to make sure that we have it very clear how we can tier these um, purchases, the community land trust. Um, so here's kind of the idea. Acquisition numbers are just market rate. We have not, um, the owners have not given us numbers. These are not what we're actually purchasing them for. And to stay affordable, there is still the option of um, financing. So it's not that this has to, oh, HUD has to award all of it for this to work. Uh, financing is still an option for acquisition, um, as well as infrastructure if needed. And I just want to thank all of our grant writers. This is a massive undertaking. Um, and they kind of had to put aside some of their other work. So I have Nicole and Regan with me because they helped write the, the bulk of this. So if there's additional questions, they're going to be able to answer them for us. But we had many others that um, contributed as well. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much, Alexis. Well, we are in a public hearing to consider that the City Council uh, hold a public hearing on May 29th, 2024, following a 15-day public comment period, and also to solicit input on the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development price grant application due July 10th, 2024. So now is the time for public input. Um, I just want to reiterate a couple of quick things. We are going to stick, there's a lot of people in here, and I'd love to hear from as many as possible. So we are going to stick to a 30-minute time limit for public input. Um, you have a max of five minutes each. Each, but if you shrink that, then more people can go. 
So hopefully we can hear from more people and we get a chance to, to really hear the, the comments that people have. So I invite people up um, to keep things moving too. If you, uh, if you want to give comments um, after the next speaker, you can line up over against the wall over here and then to be able to be ready to give more comments. So whoever would like to kick us off, I'm guessing we have a few. Hi. Mr. Mayor and City Council, I appreciate you having us here. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Carla Croffel, and I am a resident of the park. I have been for over 36 years. I'm also president of the Table Mount Neighborhood Association, and I'm co-chair of the Iowa Manufacturing Residents Network. I moved to this park back in 1988. Lot rent was $89, and that included water, sewage, and garbage. During the years between 1988 and 2017, our rent went up maybe $10 or $12, but it wasn't every year. In July of 2017, we were at $270 a month. That is when Impact came in and bought us out. The first thing they did is they raised it $40. Since then, I am up to $574 a month. That is over $300 I am paying in less than seven years. Living in a mobile home was to be affordable. Residents own their own homes and we maintain them. We do all our maintenance, yard work, snow shoveling. We are just renting the ground that our home sits on. The infrastructure needs to be updated. It hasn't been done since the park was built. One resident can't run a central air or his washing machine at the same time because it blows fuses. Pipes underground need to be also redone. With all the money that we pay in rent, we should be getting something back for our buck, like all the trees that were removed. They said new trees would be planted. We haven't seen that happen yet either. They put water meters in twice. They weren't licensed when they came in to do it. They took the, we were out of town and I came home and I seen handprints all over the side of my siding. And I took off the skirting and I seen they took our insulation and everything off. So I went looking for them and I told them they needed to come back and do it right so he came over, the supervisor did, and he goes, you know, it's hard to get good help. I said, I know, but if they're gonna take the insulation off, they need to redo it right, because you've got elderly that don't go out under their homes. And he said he understood, so he did it, he left. Eight o'clock that night, he came back. He said, I need to go under your home. I said, what for? He said, I need to check something. He came out, I asked him what he was checking. Oh, they put the meter on wrong. Well, I'm not the smartest person, but if you're a supervisor, you would know that the meter was on backwards. I would think. We have a storm shelter. And when the storms are coming, we have to go over and make sure the storm shelter is open. And there's quite a few people that do use this storm shelter. I know there are kids that vandalize it, but then the parents need to be re responsible for what their kids do. We have many elderly and disabled residents who are living on a fixed income. When you're only getting 1,000 or 1,200 a month <coughs> after you pay their rent, there isn't much left to buy medicine, groceries, utilities, or insurance. They can't even treat themselves to a happy meal. With all these companies gouging the less fortunate, they are forcing more people to go on public assistance, and not to mention that all this money they collect every month doesn't even stay in the state of Iowa. We have been to the State House many times to tell our stories. We have met with state makers. A lot of them want to help us, but we have quite a few that won't because they're being paid off by the lobbyists of these mobile home parks. We don't have the money to compete against them. 
Mobile home parks are the fastest money making there is in the United States. They teach people how to buy the parks up. They put up a fancy sign and they say, don't, know, don't get to know your residents. As they said in many of their videos, we are hostages and we have to pay the rent or we lose our home. And then they can come in and take possession of it and sell it. I just, there's so many residents that have gotten tired, they've walked away and left the keys on the counter. But is this the American way that the corporations are so greedy that they do not care about people's lives? We went to the State House five years ago and they had a lobbyist speaking. And when we left that night, they were yelling at her because of the speech she gave. And the one guy said, you need to take down the purple shirt people. Well, we're still here and we're still fighting. Um, so real quick, Carla, I hate to have to ask you this question. What's your address? We need oh, you. Sorry, 26 of four Gardnerville Drive. Thank you very much. We'll need name and address too. And I, I appreciate people's support, but I do ask to, to please hold applause as we go through the evening. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name's Evan Hudson. I live at 741 West 3rd Street. Um, I, this makes me so happy. I remember when, when Jaime first came to Dubuque at our first meeting of CCI, we were trying to figure out what should CCI do in Dubuque. And I kept yelling, community land trust, community land trust. And it's happening, you guys are doing it. And it makes me so happy. Table Mound Strong has been working for like five years. Everyone knows it's a win-win-win a, a situation. I know Danny, you like took the initiative on, on this and it just, man, it's a vision of a future where things are getting better instead of worse all the time. And that makes me feel so good. Um, I looked at the report today, um, the, or the grant application, and it's, Awesome, thank you to the grant writers. But um, I had a few thoughts. Um, one is that the, the plan is really well laid out, but I, I didn't see a lot of mentions of the work that Table Mound Strong has been doing for the last five years. And that the, the people are what is going to make this work. Um, and I feel like that's a real strength for the application is to indicate that the the organizational structure and the, the human resources are all already in place, that it wouldn't be coming in from top down, but it would be bottom up and, and a collaboration instead of kind of something that we'd be saying is, is going to come from nowhere. Because you just saw Carla, she's awesome, and they have like 50 other people, 60 other people, and, and I think that's one of the things that makes community land trusts really special to me, is that it's a way of, um, leveraging the human resources in the community where people take ownership. They're stakeholders as opposed to passive recipients and are passive observers of what's going on in their lives. And so, like, for example, I saw in the disaster preparedness section of the, of the application, um, the storm shelters, that is a, a great use of funds, but it's also in every disaster situation, it's the, the humans that have to come together. And presumably, as part of the community land trust, there will be, you know, say, volunteer teams or, or people who are in charge of coordinating resources and so forth. Um, anyway, uh, and, and second, um, one thing, like this isn't just a Dubuque issue, it's something that all across Iowa, like Carla said, there's already organizations in place of mobile home residents who have come together and they're trying to, the REIT, commercial real estate, this is something that's nationwide, it's viewed as a, an investment instead of uh, uh, housing as a human right. And um, so I was thinking about how that's a strength of this particular project that could the people who are funding at HUD might be interested in is how this could serve as a kind of pilot test that could be replicated um, if data is gathered and, and reports are issued, then Dubuque could be viewed as a leader, statewide, countywide, nationwide, because 
This, the same story that played out in Table Mound with impact has played out across the country. And that the, the data gathering that would be required for that kind of document to, to come together has already started with CCI and Table Mound Strong doing canvassing. Is there's quantitative data, but there's also qualitative data. And it's the, the stories of how people's lives have been impacted by these large corporations. And equally powerful, if we get the grant, will be the stories of how this type of structure, public-private partnership and community ownership, is, um, makes a qualitative impact on people's lives. So um, I think I, I, I wrote some um, like language for or suggested language suggestions. I don't know who to send that to, but I can submit that to wherever is convenient. Thank you. Evan, thank you very much for your comments. Hello, Lindsay James, 2494 Pearl Street, Dubuque, Iowa, 52001, proud resident of our city. Mr. Mayor, hello. Um, members of the council, hello. Um, I am here in a more official capacity. I serve as um, the, the Iowa House State Representative for District 71. That includes uh, Table, Mo Table Mound Mobile Home Park. And I just wanted to set a little bit of context for this conversation. Um, when I was out knocking doors in my first campaign, I had a conversation with a gentleman at Table Mound Mobile Home Park who, was, who said to me that he was making the decision because of increasing rent as to whether or not he would have to save, um, you know, use his money to pay for rent or use his money to pay for his insulin medication. And, you know, so he was making this impossible choice. Do I keep my home? Do I keep my foot? Right, essentially, because of all of the complications if you do not take insulin medication. A mom who was forced to consider selling her car, her only form of transportation, in order to pay increasing rent. A grandmother who was hoping to spend her retirement uh, playing with her grandchildren was forced to go back into work in order to pay for increasing rents. So the folks at mobile home, uh, in mobile home parks um, in our city are really making impossible choices and choices that no Iowan should have to make, especially because um, we are the kind of community that takes care of each other. And so this is not unique to uh, Dubuque. This is happening all across the state and all across the country. I have been grateful. Dubuque has been in the news not only statewide, but nationally. Uh, the New Yorker ran an article on Table Mound Mobile Home Park and highlighted these predatory companies that are coming into our state, buying the land, putting in impossible situations for these residents. And so I want to just say that one of the things that I feel most proud of is that our city does not take no for an answer. More importantly, neither do our residents. <laughs> and I want to, to communicate to you all and to um, the folks at the federal level who are considering this application that this is a group of residents whose heart, resilience, and persistence will make this work. After five years of pushing for better protections for mobile home residents at the legislature um, and seeing doors being slammed shut over and over and over again, it has become clear that the leadership on the state level is uninterested in mobile home protections. And so I think that this is the point where we have to get creative with our resources and our problem solving and leave it to the Dubuque City Council to really step that up and say, hey, let's try something new. So I feel very proud of this group um, and the work that you're doing, and then I feel especially proud of this group. But these um, are residents who will find their way, and they are not giving up. And so um, I'm just here to say that they will make an incredible community um, that everyone can be proud of to live in. So thank you for the time. Well, thank, thank you, Lindsay, for your comments. Hey, uh, Zoe Fortson, uh, address is 299 uh, Main Street. I just wanted to say that when I door knocked in Table Mound, um, one of the things that I heard about over and over again was the rent increases. It was a top concern for a lot of the residents, and um, as you've heard, and we'll probably hear more of today. 
Thank you very much, Zoe, for your comments. Wait, is this to accommodate for the tall person in the room? Hi, I'm Nina Arba, apartment, uh, sorry, 180 West 15th Street in Dubuque, and I must say, I want to be, I want to be thoroughly happy for all of this. I give Alexis and the other grad writers credit for making sure that most every detail was thought out so that every aspect of this community land trust proposal has been covered so that we can walk out of here with our heads held high and not have to worry about a thing if HUD passes the, gives us this money, but this may be my neurotic personality, but there are a couple of things that still are leaving me uneasy about this grant application. This first one is, what if HUD doesn't grant us all the money? What if they decide to give us only part, part of the 50 million that we're asking for and not the full amount? So can we get a guarantee that the funding will come from elsewhere, be it the city itself or from other sources so that we're not you know, continuing to fight as hard as we are to make sure that all of the necessary changes need to be made so that we can get this off of our backs. And the second one is the timeline that Alexis put in her presentation was quite chilling because as much as I want to be pleased that the, the timeline will go through without any hitches, that's still we're looking at four to six years for full implementation for problems that need to be fixed now. So given the turbulent political climate that we're in, can we also get a guarantee that HUD won't decide, oh, we're going to you know, yank this program, so whatever money we did have to give you, we're not going to give it to you anymore. So I would like to make sure that those guarantees are taken care of so that we can be able to sleep easy tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Nino, for your comments. Hello, my name is Robert Scott. I live at 721 John Noonan Street in Table Mound 1. Um, I want to just uh, thank you guys for showing up and obviously addressing the situation. Um, I have actually been a resident for about two, two and a half years. And from the moment I moved into the, into the trailer park, I've been lied to, deceived. I was pushed into a trailer that obviously was not what I wanted, not what I requested. I was told numerous things over the years, including this past year over, you know, in June, they said that they were gonna cut the trees down. I have almost a dead tree in my backyard that they still have not cut down over a year later, which resulted in this past winter, actually a branch breaking off, taking off half of my siding of my house, causing my pipes to, causing my skirting to get damaged, which led to obviously my pipes freezing. My lovely neighbor was actually nice enough to come over and help me out to get them dethawed. But I was, I was told by the trailer park to turn my, my, let my water run so they wouldn't freeze. I have it on text from them. And I did this and the next month, my water, my, my bill, my lot rent, the next month was $1,293. That's ridiculous. That's shameful. I, had, I actually lost a job because of their poor maintenance around this park. They did not plow the street. I called the, the boss, his name was James Cole, and I told him about the, about the street not being plowed. He said, oh, they've already been down it. No, they weren't. I had videotape of it all. When they finally did come down, they laid down rock sand and thought that that would help. No, it did not. After complaining and complaining and complaining numerous times over, they finally put down rock salt, and then they complained to me saying that they were paying out $1,200 to the guy to do this, which cost me my job. Now I'm sitting here, I don't know, six months later, I'm two months behind in my rent, I'm about ready to be, my place is about ready to be taken out from underneath of me because of these slumlords and idiots who obviously do not know how to take care of the residents or keep their promises. This is pitiful. 
And obviously, if you guys are going to be taking over this, this place, something needs to be changed about this. The lot rents are way too high. They don't take care of the parks. They lie to their tenants. From the moment I moved in, they lied to me. They said I was going to get a three-bedroom, two-bath mobile home. I told them I was going to be down there moving in within about a month. Within three weeks, they said, oh, well, we still don't have your mobile home. It's on back, it's on back order over in Indiana. They said, oh, well, we have another mobile home. Let us show you this one. I had one week to decide whether or not this was going to be the mobile home that I needed to buy. After putting down four grand as a deposit, I had to move into this mobile home that was a third person owned. And it wasn't even the mobile home that I wanted. And now I'm stuck in it because I had to sign a five year per diem that says I cannot move it out of my mobile home without paying 10 grand or 20 grand to move it. I'm in a situation where I cannot move it because I cannot pay that amount to, to move it. And I don't, and I obviously can't keep paying the rent because I'm so far behind because of the neglect and their stupidity. This is outrageous. I don't know whether to cry or pull my hair out. As a Dubuque person, I've lived in, my family's lived in Dubuque since 1832. My family has been founding family members of Dubuque since then. My family has broken their back for the city. I find that this is obviously a great move that you guys are going to be buying up the park. But there's no guarantees. This is what is, is shameful. And the only guarantee I have is slumlords running me down to the ground, taking every last penny out of my pocket, making me broker, ruining my credit, which nowadays credit is everything. That's all I have to say. It's just really shameful. Thank you guys for your time and your efforts. Have a good night. Thank you, Robert, for your comments. I'm shorter. <laughs> How do I? There's a button like a toggle. You're right. Oh, this? Yeah. Oh, it's too fancy. I can't do it. Okay, I'll tiptoe. Corey will step out and help you real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry. Too. You can go ahead and start. Yeah. Hi, my name is Teresa Green. I live at 4109 Bluebird Drive in Terrace Heights. So uh, my situation's going to be a little bit different. I could share some negative things, some bad things that have happened, um, but actually I kind of wanted to share just a little bit of a story. So I had my first child at 16. That was really hard. And I hopped around from apartment to apartment until I was about 20 years old when I had the opportunity to purchase a home in Terrace Heights. That changed my life. I raised three wonderful children there, all three, which by the way, are in college. One going to be an astrophysicist at Loris, uh, another one going to be an educator like his mother, um, and another child that's going into theater and acting, so pray for him. Um, <laughs> I raised those children in Terrace Heights. Thank God I had that opportunity. Here's the thing though, what about that next girl? What about that other 16-year-old girl that now can't find affordable housing? She wants to raise a family, too. The rent is, with my water, garbage, and I own my home, or sorry, $589 a month. And I own my home. I just want you to keep that in mind, because that 16-year-old girl or that 18-year-old girl who's trying to raise children, because yes, she got pregnant, we want her to keep the children, right? We want her to raise them. We want them to be wonderful children. Then we need to support those women. And those women need affordable housing. So thank God. Now, later down the road, I found my wonderful husband. He's in the audience. He's amazing. He has helped support me. And we still live in Terrace Heights. We raise those children. We still live in Terrace Heights because now they're in college. I don't know if you guys realize this is really expensive. Um, I'm a teacher, so I don't make a ton of money, but I'm not... You know, I'm not broke. I work at NICC. I love being there. So I'm part of this community, and I'd love for you guys to keep fighting to keep this community safe and affordable for people like me. Because I grew up, I went to college, I have a master's degree, right? Because 
because this city gave me that opportunity to do that, because Terrace Heights gave me the opportunity to do that. So please keep supporting people like me. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa, for your comments. There's usually not this many people here. I'm a little nervous. Um, yeah, my name is Jaime Izaguirre. Uh, I live at 1394 Locust Street, and I'm a community organizer and member of Iowa Citizens for Community Improvement. Um, over the past six months, uh, I've knocked on over 1,000 mobile home doors in our state, uh, personally, and many of them were owned by Impact and Yes Communities. Um, and I can tell you that they do not create communities. They drain them. Uh, of all of our resources. Um, over the past six months, we've been exclusively focusing on mobile home parks owned by Impact and Yes that were purchased using federally financed loans through Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, uh, and Table Mound and Terrace Heights were among those. Um, and I wanna read one testimonial from Table Mound that we received, which we have given you uh, hard copies of each of those complaints. Um, I'm doing this for my mom, who is on a fixed income at the age of 90. Her rent keeps going up, and she can't afford the things that need to be fixed on her trailer. Her rent going up is causing her to choose to pay for her medicine or food and not being able to do anything else that needs to be done around her trailer. Senior citizens live here because it's affordable living, and that's not the case anymore. They are getting taken advantage of without anybody taking action. Um, so first of all, I want to thank you for taking that action, because uh, this is it. Uh, and then the second thing I want to say is that this is verifiably true, because um, I have attached another um, piece, um, Adrian has it, uh, from Muscatine Power and Water, right, which is the utility provider for the Muscatine, city of Muscatine. And uh, this letter is to residents of an impact-owned park in Muscatine. Um, it reads, MPW sells water directly to your mobile home park owner at a very reasonable cost. Park Plaza MHP Mobile Home Park then resells that water to you at a higher cost. This practice is not something we can control, nor do we approve of it. Because we are concerned about the higher rates you are being charged and the safety of your water system, we reported this issue to the Iowa DNR. We encourage you to contact the Iowa Attorney General, Iowa Utilities Board, Iowa DNR, and State of Iowa Office of Ombudsman to share any concerns you may have. Um, and so this is directly from a utility provider um, alleging that impact is overcharging on rates. And um, who here feels like they've gotten a fishy water bill from Table Mount or Terrace Heights? Exactly, yeah. Um, so that tracks, right? Um, so, you know, I, I could go on and on uh, about impact, about Yes Communities. Um, you also have an article about uh, a Davenport Yes Communities park named Silver Creek where a woman's uh, home she was evicted from because of sewage backup that lasted two months, which Yes Communities then refused to clean up. Um, but I'm not going to go on and on about how terrible they are, right? Um, so um, what I do uh, want to say, right, it's like, you know, of course this measure would save working families uh, hundreds of dollars in rent every year, um, right? It would be massively beneficial to our economy, uh, and it would help address Dubuque's low-income housing shortage. Um, but the thing that I want HUD to know is that this idea uh, came from the residents uh, that we've been working with, um, and it... It came up last summer in the back of a bar and grill, right, um, Berkey's. Uh, so thank you, Berkey's, for helping make it happen. Um, right, but th this, the reason why I want HUD to know this is because it reminds me of a quote from the late Paul Wellstone, right? Um, and he says, significant social change comes from the bottom up from an aroused opinion that forces our ruling institutions to do the right thing, right? And much how these parks have been hurt by federal financing, it can be right. It can be made right uh, by HUD, right? Um, and so uh, I just want to close by saying, Alexis, Brad, Mike, Danny, you've been in these conversations with us. We thank you so much for listening to us, for taking action, for creating this plan. Um, and I, I, I just want to say one last thing, and that's that HUD, we, we really need you to help us cross the finish line on this, this five-year-long fight. Um, this is a direct and worthy investment in working people, and we need you to award this grant to the Dubuque. Thank you. Thank you, Jaime, for your comments. Uh, 
Um, hi, my name is Molly Olds, and my address is 2702 Lamont Drive in Dubuque. Um, I would like to thank Mayor Cavanaugh and the Dubuque City Council members for the opportunity for public input on the price grant application. Um, that includes Table Mound. I have been a resident at Table Mound Park for 14 years. Um, I'm kind of a little bit late to joining the Table Mound Strong movement um, because I've been really afraid of um, you know, having retaliation in the form of eviction if I were to speak out against this company that has taken over. Um, I'm not in a position to move my home if they were to evict me or not renew my lease. In the years since Impact Communities has operated Table Mound Park, I watched the amount that I pay to them sharply increase overall by 111%. I have also seen the roads and driveways cracking, the curbs are crumbling, 400 plus trees were removed and not replaced after promises that some of them would be. Um, the storm shelter is sometimes rented out and we don't have access to use it. The snow removal during the winter for the roads has decreased in the amount of time it takes them to do it and the frequency of how often it is, even though that's supposed to be part of what we're paying for. Um, my home is along the hill that's leading in and out of the park and I can hear the cars all the time sliding, trying to get up the hill or down the hill safely. Um, areas of the road along my lawn also constantly have water and wet areas on them, even on dry, sunny days. And I believe that that's caused by water pipe issues that are not being addressed for years. I have also caught employee, uh, an employee of the park using my home's attached outdoor faucet to collect water for testing without asking my permission to use my home's faucet. Um, it was water that I was paying for that they were using to test the water. I believe it was taken from my lot because I am at the beginning of where the line would be and it wouldn't be showing um, if you are down further in the park where there could be other issues with the pipes, there wouldn't be as much of that that it would have to go through to be tested. Um, when I caught them, they confirmed that it was occurring for at least a month already at that point. It was in November and the temperatures were freezing. Um, luckily, I caught them at that time and I did install a lock on my faucet so that they can no longer take that water without my permission. Um, I, I can't even imagine how much damage I would have had if it had been um, left open and there were several times where it was left dripping. There are no boundaries that Impact Community is not willing to cross to do their business. The owners of the company not only make profits from price gouging manufactured home communities, but they also sell courses and training materials and how to follow that business model. There are clips available online from these courses and the lessons that they teach and the comments that they make are appalling and demeaning. Many of the council members are either business owners or have experience with public or private service. And I'm sure that most of you would agree that it is rare for a business to maintain success without investing back into the business and working with a goal to provide excellent service to your customer. A city that wouldn't invest in its community would not thrive. Impact Communities is not investing in Table Mound Park. It is not supporting the infrastructure of the park. It does not invest back into the Table Mound Park community. Impact Communities will bleed residents dry and then sell or destroy our park. If the city applies and is awarded this HUD price grant and is able to remove impact communities from our community, the park can thrive. There are more than 400 Dubuque families that will feel that impact. Dubuque strives to be a sustainable, resilient, inclusive, and equitable community that provides choices for quality, affordable, livable neighborhoods. That's what Table Mound Park residents want. We are simply trying to live in quality homes within our budgets in a neighborhood where we can feel safe and happy. Based on experiences with impact communities that other parks have vocalized and based on Iowa's inability to pass better regulations for resident rights, our park needs this assistance. This may be the last chance to stop impact communities' predatory business practices from infecting our city. We have nothing to lose by attempting this option, but our community has everything to gain. Thank you. Thank you, Molly, for your comments. So I see two more people standing there waiting to speak. We'll go ahead and do the last two speakers then, please. Thank you. I am Carla Shepard, and I live at 2710 Potosi Drive in Table Mound Park. 
And I just want to say that I am so excited that you guys are trying to help us, and I just hope it goes through. And it will be so nice that everybody is going to be treated fairly and that the money will stay in the city. And that's all I got. But I'm excited that you're helping us. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, for your comments. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my name is Gail Weitz, and I live at 1630 Lori Court here in Dubuque and have been following this. And I just, the only thing I can think of is there needs to be a mechanism where we can look in the, toward the future. I was married in 1968, and at that time, we were in Dubuque, we couldn't find a place to live. There was a housing shortage. And luckily, we got towards the end, we actually considered renting out a motel room by the week because there was literally no place to go, and luckily we found a used trailer and started out married life in a trailer, which was economical. It was good, it was a good experience. So there should be some type of a mechanism. I know economics are cyclical, but housing should not be that way. There should be a plan put in place by the city to try to prevent this. You know, um, and I'm not an expert, I don't know how, but I'm sure that it would be appreciated in the future so that we don't have to face this type of situation. So thanks, thanks for listening. Thank you, Gail, for your comments. Okay, well thank you everyone for uh, providing public input um, and also providing written input as well. So I, I will ask now too, I, 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 we don't have any more time for any virtual input, um, but were there any comments being made? There is one for? written comment. Okay. It, um, they asked to be read into the record if you have time. Yes, sure. please, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, this comment was submitted by Timothy Stauffer of 390 Wood Inwood Avenue, 3901 Inwood Avenue. And Timothy says, I am opposed to moving forward with this on grounds of both the public money spent on this and on the effect of the surrounding neighborhood. I live right next to Terrace Heights and I'm concerned heavily about what happens to neighborhoods that are publicly owned and artificially lowered in price. Public run properties, though always started with good intention, are notorious for mismanagement, lack of maintenance, and tearing down the quality of its own living conditions and surrounding neighborhood. I am in favor of pursuing action for getting shelters up to code and utilities fixed. I am in favor of finding a way to improve living conditions for current residents, but that's not what this proposal is about. And that is the only virtual input that I've received. Okay. Well, thank you, Timothy, for your comments. Um, Adrian, City yes. Clerk's Office. Written input has been received from the following individuals, Kathleen and Harold Werner, Carrie Moyer and Tommy Hall of 2802 Kramer Park Drive, Ralph Rowling, Chris Schroeder, Betty Schuster, Chris Hamill of 2763 Bankston, Michael Link of 1190 McGregor, Matt Otterbeck, Jeff Stevens of 2600 Garnavillo Drive, Kathy Hoffman, Carla Craftful, Melissa Steinus, Nancy Clark, Angie Thomas of 2539 Hanover Drive, Kathy Thompson, Sue Luce, Carla Shepard, Deb Hankinson, Kimberly and Adam Quas, Rhonda Sheffert of 2735 Monastery Drive, Molly Olds of 2702 Lamont Drive, Pamela Brandt of 2785 Monastery Drive, Stephanie Small, State Representative Chuck Eisenhart, and Danielle Liebfried, President and CEO of the United Way of the Dubuque Area Tri-States, and all of this written input has been uploaded to the agenda item. All right, thank you very much, Adrian. Okay, so now's the part where we come back to us and we talk about things and then eventually take a vote on the item in front of us. So um, before I open it up to my colleagues to, to make comments though, Alexis, can I get some clarification on, a, on something? I think it would be helpful for us to, to understand this fully before we all dig into it a little bit more. So the idea here is that we would apply for this grant and then using that grant, assist the residents of Table Mountain Terrace Heights to create a community land trust. And they, as residents, would then be in charge of that community land trust as a sort of a, it's a nonprofit organization, correct? It would, they'd form a board, they would govern themselves over time. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that means for how the city, you know, we, we jump in as the, as essentially to help in this process start it, but then there's a process where we phase out, correct? 
Can you talk about that a little bit more so we can get some clarification on it? Sure. So the idea is we'll actually have a community land trust consultant that helps in uh, developing and getting all the bylaws and boards and meetings and things, kind of the policies and procedures set up. Staff is there to help build capacity. So in the community land trust side, we're there to help, you know, start scheduling meetings, you know, get, get all of that started. So within the first year or two, making sure that that is on its own and moving along and and then phase out in years three through six um, as everything starts working. We're still there, we're still in the background, and we are still, as staff, going to be working on the rehabs and um, that type of work in the park, just not the community land trust side. Mm -hmm. So we're still there if something, there's a hiccup, there's a changeover in a board, something that happens, we're still there for capacity as needed for those last years. Um, and a community land trust can be set up several different ways. Um, you talk about forming a nonprofit with uh, residents, and that could be one option. Um, another option is utilizing a nonprofit that already exists in the city of Dubuque as the backbone, and then the each uh, mobile home park has their own board, so that they can actually set policies for each of their three and have three different bylaws and policies. So there's there's different ways to, to do that. Uh, the consultant's going to do community engagement, make sure all the residents understand each pros and cons of each type, um, and then move forward with which one works. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. But just to, to clarify one a little bit further, this is not really public housing then, is it? It's not the city comes in, takes over as the, the landlord. Yeah, we will instance. never be the landlord. Okay. So then it, it becomes, we immediately go th start this process of creating a community land trust to help the residents or a nonprofit, like you described, be able to take over. And then just to, to talk about the city's involvement a little bit more, at that point, it's in, within the city of Dubuque then, right? I mean, the, the locations, it's, I know there's one side of Table Mound that's in the county, so, but the places that are within the city of Dubuque, um, could receive city services if if requested in that way. Is that kind of the way that's going to work? I mean, right now it's, you know, the, the park has its own infrastructure and utilities and things like that, and the city sort of stops right at the boundaries. Will that change at all in this process, or could it change? No, it remains private uh, infrastructure. doesn't mean we can't um, have it upgraded. So getting up to code, getting new infrastructure, but it would still remain private infrastructure. Um, and then we want to make it, that's why we want to make it new so that it can be affordable long term. You can build your fund for big capital projects over time before one of those bigger things comes up down the road. So no, it's not going to be public infrastructure. And that's just how the land is zoned and set up. And we're not changing that because we'll never have ownership. So the land is always going to be private. We can't we're not gonna change or can't really change any of that. So we will stop at that, um, but we will have more support for them. So things that maybe they can't access today, such as water meter inspections and things that the state controls, um, we have a little more, if they want it, we can service. We can be there to inspect, we can be there to change out um, certain things in that infrastructure. So we're there for guidance more than we can be today. Very helpful. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Ms. I also have a question for Alexis. Shoot. So you um, have a slide that talks about the current budget. Yes. And you've got table on one, two, and then Terrace Heights. Yes. Thank you. Um, and uh, there was a comment made that what happens if we don't get this fund mm -hmm. or if we get partial funding? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, with great appreciation that it's stepped over several years, I think which really helps in financial acquisition and expenditures. Could you enlighten us if there are any backup plans or alternative plans for funding or how you see this rolling out in the event that HUD is uh, not giving us the 50 million we're requesting? So HUD has the option of doing tiers or a hard no, nothing, right? Or all of what you want. Um, we're trying to tier it to make sure that we get something so that we can make it affordable and have other options like financing. And that financing would be from under the nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. um, the, the land and the lot rents actually are revenue that allow them to you know, finance any some of this information. Um, but you only want to do so much of that. So um, that's actually going to be written in the application. We wanted to hear comments before we get all of that into the application. So it's going to be a little more clear. You know, if, if you give us this much HUD, here's what we can accomplish. And if you give us this much, here's what more we can accomplish. If you give us nothing, we're still working towards 
development of a community land trust, but it's going to have to start, you know, we're, we're going to be looking towards this group here to help us do that. And um, we support it with research and, and going to Des Moines, doing some of the community land trust as well. But that's where we're going to have to start if we get the zero. Okay, so the bottom line is we're going to push for community land trust irrespective of HUD? That right now, that's what the residents have been asking for, okay. yes. Okay, and that gives us the um, mechanism or the avenue or the organization for which we can at least start to do some change and some improvement. Yeah, if, if they can get control, then mm -hmm. you stop the profit that's coming out of their rents. So all of the rent can go back into the and community. And then I guess a further discussion would be as to if we had to finance how we would do that and, and how that occurs. Mm -hmm. And that's always under the nonprofit, so that's not with city. So that wouldn't be under our bonds. That wouldn't be under anything that is our side. It wouldn't be in our budget. That would be on the nonprofit and the community land trust. And that that organization can then go out for financing under their their model. And we can just for everybody's understanding, we can create a community land trust without actually owning the land, without purchasing Table Mound One, Table Mound Two, and Terrace Heights. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. All right. Did you have anything else? Uh, later. Later. Okay. All right. So, open up the floor here, and I, Mr. Resnick, I, I did not forget you're on the phone. You can jump in if you need to. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Well, I'm proud of you, folks. Um, we we feel a little of your pain because we feel like we've had our fingers slammed in the door a number of times as well. Um, when we look to our state government for help, and it's not there. And not only is it not there, but they're telling us that we can't help in, in many ways. So we found a way that, that we can maybe facilitate a really big change. And I couldn't be more for this. Um, there's, there's nothing you could tell me that would surprise me about the behavior of these owners. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of it. And I, I lived at Table Mount too back in 1979, 80, 81. And it was a pretty decent experience back then. Didn't cost me too much. Fairly new park. Everything worked. Um, but a lot, of the, a lot of what was there then is there now. And not looking that good as it, as it did then. Um, it's aged a little bit. So I'm going to vote for this. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that it all works. There is the chance that it won't. So I, I don't want to make anybody a promise here that we're going to solve this thing by what we do here tonight, but we're gonna sure take a, we're not gonna walk away from it, at least I'm not. This is a, an important issue to you, it's an important issue to me, and it's an important <coughs> issue to Dubuque, that we take care of you, that we make life a little bit fairer when we can, and that's what government's all about, is to try and get things out of your way and, and allow you to live a, a decent life. And there's a lot of things in your way, and we didn't put them there, but we'll be real happy to help you knock them down. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Roussel. Thank you. Well, first, I, I want to applaud all of you. Um, you've been working so hard for so many years to find legislative solutions to your problems with, with no relief. And what's really impressive is that you take your time to advocate not just for yourself, but for your neighbors. And I think tonight is certainly a, a good example of that. And I think it should definitely be a um, a strength of our application. We have uh, examples of the hard work of the group that lives there. Um, I've met many of you over the years. I've been to your homes. I, I know they're a place of pride, but your stories are heartbreaking. And, and we're dealing with people's very basic needs not being met, being worried about becoming homeless every day. And so I'm really proud of our staff for, for finding this possibility for this grant and working on the application. Uh, livable neighborhoods and affording housing, affordable housing is one of our top goals. If there's a possibility to help these residents who've been fighting so hard for so long, let's, make, let's work to make this happen. We want this to be a livable neighborhood. That's a great place to live together. And I know that there's going to be many details to resolve as we move forward, but let's take this first step to apply for this grant. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Roussel. Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> um, when, I, when I remember first coming onto council and hearing this story, and there was only like maybe 
20 ish people in that at that meeting. It was heartbreaking. And I just realized, man, these folks are getting screwed. And as many of you know, I've said worse things about the ownership of this park. Um, uh, it's it's so frustrating. And I know the state, we've tried to appeal to the state and I know, and I'm not pointing fingers or anything. And it, we've tried and they've tried. And I'm glad that we finally come to something that we can hopefully give hope that we can uh, yeah, I just pray that this goes because we all need to do this. But I'm glad that there is a possible plan with the land trust of finding that. And hopefully we could get another organization involved if HUD doesn't help us out. Fingers crossed, everyone. I'm, I'm definitely going to be supporting this. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Sprank. Yeah, Ms. Weffel. I have a couple questions for Alexis. Um, my questions are based on um, things that actually have been sent to me or requested by a neighbor who stopped at my front porch. Um, and you have been so great about answering our questions through this process, so thank you. Um, one question I received was, why don't we just buy a blank slate of land and create a mobile home park? Could you explain the reasons for that being a difficult situation? Sure, so the costs uh, of that are triple to 10 times what we're asking for HUD. Um, and then we're not talking about land acquisition. That's not where the cost is. Um, infrastructure in the ground is extremely expensive. Um, if we were to have to replace absolutely all of the infrastructure in just one of these, um, we're, you know, just one mobile home park right now, we're talking 20 to 25 million just for underground pipes and redoing your roads. Also, because the water is underneath every single mobile home park, you're, you're talking about having to service all of the infrastructure first, having no revenue, and then having to put mobile home parks all brand new, all of your actual units in on top of that. Um, each one is sixty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars today. As you get down the road, those are going to increase in cost as well. Um, it's just not feasible to just start over and abandon. Um, cost is just through the roof. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think also um, comment was made upon the fact that um, just the idea that even those mobile homes that may be moved because they would um, endure that move, mm -hmm. not all of them would. Yes. And the deciding factor for residents with that as well. And we wanna take care of residents who are currently there as well as future residents to ensure their safety and, mm -hmm. and their long-term. You also feasibility. just cannot put a dollar amount on a community that's already built. Right. So you cannot, you, you just can't put a value on that and it's already there. It exists behind us, all of these people, but there's several who couldn't be here today. And you can't just uproot everybody and think that that community is gonna be rebuilt right away somewhere new. Thank you. That was a question I received from more than one person, so I appreciate your time on it. Um, one other piece of that uh, that was related to a question is, what is the reality of being able to negotiate with um, impact and yes regarding the purchase of the property if, if everything goes perfectly and you receive $50 million. Um, right. I just am curious about the process of, of that so that we can inform the community. Sure, and you'll see in the timeline that acquisition activities are one to two years down the line. Why that is, is because it's going to take a lot of back and forth with this community, uh, with both of them, to come to agreement as to what market rate is, um, if they're willing to, to, to leave. We've started the conversations just to you know get an idea uh, what type of appetite there is to sell. Um, and we did not receive callbacks, but we did receive calls from others who said that impact is selling. And that is important in this uh, journey. So that is um, something that will be a hiccup that we will have to deal with. But because it was public, the people are reaching out to us and saying, well, if you want it, why would we all buy it? So it's, it's an option, but we have a lot to do, a lot of work to do. 
um, you know, some of the work that's already been done, meeting with the state legislators and um, also some federal agencies, is going to help kind of push that issue um, as well when the loans are backed by the federal government and there are um, some predatory practices. So we're hoping that is going to help our side. But realistically, we're talking a couple of years of legwork, legal work, um, that's built into the grant for costs because it's going to take a while. Another question I have, um, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think you can come up with this, is what are some other examples of community land trusts that you could provide us um, that would help us to understand community land trusts? Sure. Uh, community land trusts actually are often um, like infill spaces in a city. Um, and they, you know, a nonprofit owns the land and then a stick built home is erected and it is more affordable because you don't have to buy the land. Um, you're only paying for the cost of putting that, that home on that land. So that is the most common used uh, community land trust model. Um, there's several out there, and I'm, I wish I could remember the one that we looked at in Michigan. Uh, Des Moines has been looking at it as well, but we have some um, t information in the application to point towards those. Um, mobile home parks have not been done as often as a community land trust. Um, mainly just because of the upkeep of manufactured homes themselves is a little bit more than a stick built home. Um, but it's not, not, it's not an unusual model. It's just not done as often and HUD wants to see it done more, which is why they put it in this application. And that there's more information about that in the NOFA as well. Thank you. I... I think that's my only question okay. left. OK, Thanks. thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a couple, a couple of comments. Um, Ms. Green spoke to it. And I think it's just incredibly inspiring, your story. I don't know where you are. Um, but thank you for sharing it, because I, I think it helps um, us, as well as everyone here, to feel incredibly proud of helping not just the people in the room, the people who couldn't be here tonight, but the future of our city. Uh, what, what a legacy this is going to be if we can make it happen. So thank you for pointing out your story. Um, additionally, Ms. Olds, um, I recall reading your letter based on the 111% increase. I can't remember. Um, but your letter also spoke about the Mobile Home University. And um, it made me go look and go read about that organization. And I will tell you, I, I believe in free market, but this is different. This, this model is troubling to me. Um, and I, I appreciate that you shared some of the specific organizations that um, can cause cause for alarm in our community. Um, so thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, we have a duty to access this opportunity for our community, and so I'm very proud to support it tonight. Thank you, Ms. Wethel. Mr. Resnick, do you have anything? And then I'll come back to you, Ms. Uh, yes, I do. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, of course, community land trusts are new to us, but they're not new. And so I did a lot of reading on uh, what how other communities experienced uh, the community land trust, uh, things that uh, worked really well and, and things that didn't necessarily work well. So I just want to uh, bring up a couple things. Will the uh, residents uh, be required to... Uh, uh, so when they sell their um, property, uh, many of the community land trusts require that uh, they also sell at a, a reasonable with a reasonable fee, and um, you know be be accommodated for improvements and uh, you know just uh, but not make a killing on their property. Are there going to be uh, requirements like that? Alexis is coming up, Mr. Uh, so those requirements are going to be part of the bylaws, the policies, and the procedures. So that's going to be up to the residents, the nonprofits, and the model um, to see if those are, are going to be implemented. Um, usually, right now, HUD has actually addressed some of that in their uh, grants in that 
if those fees did exist, which is to help both the person moving out and the person moving in, that it still has to remain affordable. Mm. So those fees cannot be exorbitant. They cannot increase over a certain amount. Um, they still have to meet the home rent rates for all of it put together. You can't just say, well, that's a fee that's not related. All of it together still has to be affordable. Um, so there will at least be those boundaries. However, that's going to be the community engagement when doing that community land trust is how do you continue to have be compensated if you're going to sell, but keep it affordable. I say thank you very much. Uh, another difficulty that residents sometimes had, or potential residents, uh, it was in the financing way, in that some of the uh, financiers uh, didn't understand or were reluctant to uh, loan money to properties that they didn't own the land; they just owned, uh, you know, the home on the land. And there had to be some re-education uh, involved with the uh, local uh, financial community. Are, are we we're going to work with the group to um, make sure that works pretty well, or what are the plans? That's definitely in the plans. Uh, the Office of Neighborhood and Equity and I'm shared prosperity. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> Um, they are already actually working with our banks um, to make sure we have all of those uh, connections. We work on that education kind of regularly. Um, we meet often with Dutrack and Depaco and Green State and those that mortgage often with us for affordable homes. So yes, that's on our radar. It's something that staff is going to help with building capacity for that uh, community land trust because that's a huge piece. I see that $1.2 million dollars uh, in the potential package is CDBG funds. Now, were we going to use those funds uh, for something else? And is this a one time, you know, uh, or do we uh, anticipate that we need to uh, support the community land trust with a constant supply of CDBG funds? So those CDBG funds are specifically for rehabilitation of the mobile homes. So that program is actually a program that we were working on developing because CDBG changed their reg regulations and now we can rehab manufactured homes and before we could not. So that was actually one that we were doing whether this grant existed or not. Um, over six years, it was $200,000 a year is what we were planning at the time. And so that's what we put into the application since it was going to be a program that was proposed in our annual plan starting next year. You did mention the city potential city costs. Um, and uh, it seemed like staff time was the biggest uh, amount of uh, money that we, the city was going to use. Uh, would there be potential because the city owns the land? Are we, uh, you know, is there potential legal liability at all uh, because of that ownership? So the city will never have legal ownership of the land. So that will always be under someone else. I see. So um, very good. So if, if, of course, if there's legal issues, we expect the community land trust to handle that. Yes, that will be within their capacity that is built over the time of the community land trust, over that six years of time. Okay, well, and finally, uh, I did a lot, again, a lot of reading. So the, the regulations and the funding, you know, GB, uh, pardon me, CDBG fund uh, reporting requirements, all those kind of things. Uh, many groups found that uh, professional management was needed rather than a totally volunteer group. And, and is that where you're saying... Well, if we pair with an existing nonprofit with experience in these matters, uh, that should do it. Correct. Having that uh, consultant and someone that's already done this and a nonprofit that already exists with the, all of the financial documents to start right off the bat would absolutely be the easiest way to build capacity. It's not the only way, but it is the easier path. Well, the more I read about uh, the Community Land Trust, um, the more good things I read. And uh, so many, there should be, there's a potential of, of a great deal of good uh, with this Community Land Trust. And I love to see the support that has amassed here tonight uh, supporting this. And I appreciate the comments of my council member colleagues. And I also plan to support this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Resnick. Ms. Farber. Yeah, thank you. And I also wanted to um, thank the Table Mound Strong Association for all of the um, comments, your stories, um, with your experiences, your observations, 
and the unfortunate circumstances where you really don't have an official conduit to get you guys relief. Um, but I do think that, as one of the speakers said tonight, that um, you guys are determined to cross the finish line, and I think we're going to be there to support you as well. And I just wanted to, um, Alexis, you had talked about the proposed timeline, and I just wanted to uh, answer one of the questions or just kind of make a comment about the fact that um, with the full faith and confidence of the U.S. government, meaning HUD, that there may be um, some ability to really negotiate on the prices uh, for purchasing in the long term, and I think that's something that we should realize there's some strength behind that comment. Uh, and hopefully we will get to that stage and hopefully HUD is responsive. So thank you again for the opportunity to hear all of these stories and for your presence tonight. And I know that since I've been on city council, this has been an issue that has been front and center and it has not gone unnoticed. So thank you and I plan to support. Thank you, Ms. Farber. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody else has talked, so it's my turn. So um, I gotta be completely honest with all of you. I. There's a lot of good stuff I get to experience in this role, and I really, really enjoy it. Um, there's a, a lot of great things that we're able to be a part of. But there are some frustrations, and there are um, certain things that stick with me more. And one of the things that has frustrated me so much, very personally, is every moment that I've had to look in your eyes and say to you, I don't know what else I can do. I don't know what else we can do. I don't know what else the city can do. I hate to give that answer. I, I really, I have hated it so many times to have to say that to you. And it's been extremely challenging. And I wanna thank you for continuing to come to the table and have conversations with us and continuing to work with us. This is what a community partnership looks like. When residents show up and have needs that they want to share with us and say, we need you to be on the team with us to do this. And we all get together and do it. This is, this is exactly what it looks like. I can't, I'm sorry that I can't remember, but somebody tonight talked about this being a model that we could use somewhere else. Absolutely. Absolutely, this is a model of what a community should look like. And I thank you for that. And I think the people who even asked questions and, and maybe even said that they were a little bit against this because they, for whatever reason, I thank them for being a part of the conversation as well. Um, I will say that there, there weren't that many people that said anything about this being a bad idea. I think there was more questions than anything else about how would this really work? This is gonna be new for us as a community. We haven't done this before. So this will be a new thing to try. It's also not a guarantee. And that is still a little bit frustrating. Um, but I have to tell you, thank God we have a federal government that is stepping up to the plate because we do. We have a federal government right now that is stepping up and saying people need help and we need to find a way to do it. There are also a few moments as mayor that I won't forget. And I'm not going to forget the call that I got from our city manager, Mike Van Milligan, one evening. And Mike said, hey, I think um, Alexis and her team at the Housing and Community Development Department have found a grant that might let us do exactly what we're talking about here tonight. And I was sort of speechless. I mean, I, I, I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was something to the effect of, that's one of the coolest things I've ever heard about, Mike. That's a great idea. I had no idea this existed. And, it, and I'm, I'm so glad that somebody brought it into existence because we need this help. You need this help. We, as a city council and as a city, need this help. We wanna be able to work together and do something to help everybody with this situation. This isn't a guarantee. What we're voting on tonight is to say yes to putting a grant into the Housing and Urban Development Department. That's great, it's a great first step. If this doesn't happen, what I've heard here tonight is that we are still thinking about what are the next steps. Um, I'm gonna be straight with you, the city government, that, of the city you live in does not have the capacity to fund this by itself. <laughs> this is a big amount of money, right? But what we do have is a team that is working very hard to figure out what we can do. And continuing to meet with you on a regular basis, continuing to talk to the folks at CCI who've been very, very adamant about helping you, continuing to work with our state legislature because they do still have a lot of power in this and we still make a lot of trips to Des Moines and we still have a lot of conversations and build those relationships too. We're gonna keep doing everything we can. Um, I, personally, am going to continue to keep doing everything that I can in the role that I'm in. And I appreciate so much that you are here. I appreciate our staff so much for, for doing all this work. Um, when I looked at this grant and all the detail that goes into it, 
Alexis, your comments about what people had to drop to get this done in the short timeline doesn't surprise me at all. This is a big lift, so thank you very much for doing it. And, and of course, thank you to, to Mike and Corey for bringing this in front of us and being able to, to um, show us this possibility. So um, I think it's pretty clear I'm voting for this and really looking forward to making it happen. And we're gonna keep on pushing whatever it takes. We, we wanna keep on working with you to get some of these things done. So yeah, Alexis. Oh, I said something wrong. So here comes Alexis. I swear you didn't, I swear you didn't. <laughs> I just thought for the application, uh, everybody that's here, anyone that's willing to um, put their name and address at the back that you are here um, and just write, you know, for or against or little comments, we're gonna put paper in the back for you on your way out since not everybody was able to actually talk today. If you submitted letters, we did get them, but just a point of order for the application, they want to know who was all here if you're willing. Yeah. Okay? Thank you. That's Thank you very much, Alexis. And I don't know if you noticed, but Alexis is taking pictures of everybody who's here tonight. Um, you know, Krenna is going to, our city attorney here is going to be delivering the paper to do this. We did read everything um, that you that you sent us, along with more. Mr. Resnick was talking about all of his fun travel reading that he's been doing. So um, it's it's good to, to hear that, um, you know, I really appreciate being on a city council that, that does so much work in this way. So with all of this said, I think the thing we're most excited to do is vote for this. So um, do we have anything else from Alexis, anything from you? Okay, we're good there, all right? Um, so the motion in front of us here is to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Resnick? Aye. Farber? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. And with nothing else on the agenda, we will be adjourned for the evening.